Willie D. Live. Yo, he is known for educating the culture on how to build wealth, one share at a time. Ladies and gentlemen, Leon Howard, also known as Wall Street Trapper. What's good, OG? Welcome to the show, King. What's good, OG? How you feeling, man? I appreciate you for having oh, me. Oh, man. I'm feeling good, man. Uh, I'm very delighted to have you on the show, bro, because you represent a guy who got it out the mud. Yeah. That's a beautiful thing, man, to, to know part of what your journey is because you shared it. And a big thing with you is giving information and instructions to help us navigate through this wild, crazy, beautiful world. The finances, by building your, your finances. Up. Why is it so important to you that we normalize generational wealth? Um, so just coming up in New Orleans, I realized that every hood really had the same issues. It wasn't that we wasn't hard workers. It wasn't that we wasn't willing to take risks. It was we just ain't had the information. And so when you don't have information, then you are handicapped on on what you can accomplish and what you can do just in the world. And we think of America, we think about a country that print money all the time. We understand that there's a certain class of people that are always able to accomplish and live a certain life. But then there's another demographic, there's another class of people that all they understand is working two jobs, working through three jobs, um, hustling, you know, risking our lives to go to prison. I went to prison for 10 years for a 10 murder on robbery. And so you start to understand that if, if I had the right type of information, so I went to prison, when I was in prison, a guy introduced me to it. And I was like, damn, this, like, this is crazy. So he literally told me, like, man, y'all playing the wrong game. And for me, that was, well, you ain't here with me, so so how 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 you playing a different game for me if you ain't here with me? And so he just told me a couple things, and sometimes it don't always have to be something so profound. It can be a little nugget. He was like, man, listen, wealthy people stop trading time for money. They start making their money work for them, and they give value to people. And that just, that planted something in me that was, that was something I ain't never heard before. Mind you, I'm 16. This is 1999. I ain't never heard that before. And so just the rest of my, my sentence in prison, I just started reading books like the Rich Dad, Poor Dad books. I started looking at CNBC, and I just started realizing that, yo, being in the street and being a businessman in America is down there one and the same. It ain't no different. Like, they sell legal dope on Wall Street. They Like, the pharmaceutical business is one of the billion dollar businesses in America. So I'm like, yo, they not playing a they just playing a different game, but it's it's almost the same product. And they just playing by different rules. And so for me, you think as generational wealth, when you think about that, and I think that term get thrown around a lot in our right now, and we not really understanding like what it take. It's more than just investing. It's more than just buying property. Right? That's 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 surface level. There's information and structure that has to be there. So if we look at a company, we look at a man by the name of Cornelius Vanderbilt, right? He's the man that we are, who's responsible for the railroad system. At one point, he was the richest man in the world. Well, why nobody don't ever talk about him no more? Well, because even as a billionaire, they went broke. Didn't his they family went, go his broke? His family went broke. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. They lost all the money except yeah. for one of them that's still doing it right now. Anderson Cooper, he's a part of that family. He come off that bloodline. Anderson Cooper. Right. He's he from that bloodline. From he's from that bloodline. Right. Exactly. So, you know, that term is so, it's so just thrown out there. And for me, because I study it, I, I now see the nuances in it. And I now see the importance of it. More than just surface level, like how do you normalize your family being free? How do you normalize your family having opportunities without being slaves to the system? So it's, it's down to, to me, it's, it's breathing and then it's building wealth. Like they one and the same because we get too accustomed with operating in dysfunction. We get too accustomed to operating in chaos and lack. There's no way in the world we can live in a in a society where you have trillion dollar companies, you have men worth hundreds of billion dollars, and then you still have people that haven't checked the check. That that don't even belong in the same category to me. If America's supposed to be the land of opportunity, well, why is it that certain people have the opportunity and and others don't? And so for me, it's because we we too good with being entertained. 
we too good, we too comfortable with, with laughing. And while we laughing and being entertained, they going to the bank on us. And they setting their families up. So we look at Bernard Arnault, and I just said this the other day. So this dude became the richest man in the world during the pandemic. He don't got a technology company. He owns Louis Vuitton. He owns Moet. He owns Hennessy. He owns Fendi. He owns Dior. He's the man that owns that. Well, one of the things that he did was he made his daughter the CEO of the Tiffany company. And then he made his son, he put them on the boards of his other companies. And then what he did was he know he don't got too much longer left on his earth, even if it's 20 years, 30 years, whatever. He already put in place to where they, they can't sell none of the stock in the company for 30 years after he died. That's generational now. Then he's already put other documents that his grandkids, they, as a family, they always got to own 61% of the company. Like, that's generational wealth for me. And so when you just start understanding that these people just playing a different game than us, you either ask yourself a question. Either you're going to let them feed you or you're going to go out and get your own food and hunt on your own. Because if you allow them to feed you, then you're getting permission to starve you. Yeah. So that's why it's important to me. Yeah, let's go back, man. You you come from a city. Uh, born in a city. Yeah. Where bullets ring out, guns ring out. Yeah. In parks. And walking to the store could be an adventure. What's that upbringing like? Are you a two-parent household, mm. single mother? Mm. What's going on there? So, man, it was rough. So my mom's, I saw my mom's get shot when I was nine. Right in you know, St. Rock Park. By who? Uh, she was in the streets. So, you know, just another person in the streets being affiliated. You know how that go. And that happened to me, that was like maybe 150 yards away from me. So that was my first encounter with gun violence. My, my mama ain't die, but then I also saw my mama catch a juice for drugs and shooting somebody. You know, like she, I was a product of that. And so my mom um, went to prison and my grandmother passed away. So for about eight months of my life, at the age of 13 or 14, I'm literally, literally just homeless. Um, and then it wasn't because my people ain't love me. But I think there's a part where you just can't afford another mouth. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And I, I still don't hold it against my family, and I ain't tripping. So that was my life was like. So at 16, I go to prison for attempt murder on a robbery. So I don't get out of prison until I'm 25 years old. So my whole upbringing was from seeing the streets, experiencing the streets, and then prison. That, that was my upbringing. And this is crazy to me, man, because typically if a dude go to jail as a kid and he's in prison and he grows up to become a man while he's locked up, usually he takes on all of the bad habits from the inmates mm -hmm. that are in prison mm -hmm. because he's learning in reverse. Mm -hmm. Everything right is wrong. Everything wrong mm -hmm. is right. How did you break the cycle? So I still picked up a lot of bad habits. Um, okay. I, st I feel like I'm still, like, traumatized from prison. You know, like, I done seen dudes get set on fire. You know, I done seen dudes get, you know, feces thrown on them. I'm in a cell with them. I done seen dudes get killed in prison. I done seen dudes OD in front of my face in prison. Um, so I picked up a lot of habits that I saw from prison, but it was that. And I, so I used to run numbers in prison. And I used to get the USA Today from this dude named Chris Kellogg, this white dude, he actually went to UConn. And um, one day he told me, I always see you watching the stock market, but yet when you come get the USA Today from me, you don't get the business section, you only get the sports section. Right? And I was like, shit, well, that's where the number's at. He was like, but if you're watching the stock market, why you don't want to learn more about business? Don't focus just on the sports. That's, that ain't gonna make you a billionaire. That ain't gonna that ain't gonna get you where you gotta go. And I was like, damn, that's he was like, what you wanna be? You wanna run a casino when you go home or something? <laughs> like So that kind of just changed my mindset about just how I saw the game. But when I came home, I still got back in the streets. Like I ain't gonna never act like I just had it all figured out. And it's because of what you said. It's because of I had picked up so many bad habits, even in my mind in prison. And this may sound crazy when your audience hear it, but in my mind, I was like, oh, I could do another bit. I could do another bit. 
Because that's the talk, like, in prison. Mm -hmm. well, I, I got another 10 years in me. Oh, I could do another five. Oh, I could do another six or seven standing on my head. I ain't tripping. And to the outside world, you be like, man, y'all crazy. But in the end, but like, while you in prison, you start to normalize that environment. And you start to tell yourself, like, all right, this is my future. Like, so you start trying to put plans together on how do I become the best criminal? How do I be a better dope dealer? How do I be a better robber? How do I be a better jagger? So when I came home, I was like, all right, I ain't go to jail for selling drugs, so I'm, I might be a pretty good drug dealer. You know, I come here for shooting somebody, so I ain't tripping. But I caught another charge. I caught another charge, eight pounds, $10,000, 100 X pills, a pint of lean, a 223, and a 40. But I got found out guilty on that, fruit of a poisonous tree. And so it was in that moment, I'm like, you know what? Man, I ain't going to sell drugs no more. I'm going to just start robbing drug dealers. So I, my mind never went to, man, this ain't for me. I'm tripping. Like, there's a point where you just think, like, if, if this part of the street's not working for me, I'm going to just do something else. But it's never an idea that I won't get out the streets. Because in my mind, I felt like if you ain't doing something illegal, you ain't getting no money. Like, the streets had conditioned me. I, I was a product of that. I had been molded. All of my OGs was gangsters. You know, everybody who I looked up to was streets. My mom had been to the street. Ain't nobody telling me different. And then people who who not in the streets, the only sound advice they're giving you is go get a job. And for somebody that's in the streets, that ain't the best advice because even though they're not free, that's the sense of freedom for them. And I ain't clocking in for nobody, but yet you're risking your life. I didn't, I didn't accept it that I ain't, I don't want nobody telling me what to do. You feel what I'm saying? So, um, I almost got killed. Me and my homie went hit this lick. And then that was just one of those moments. I was like, man, I ain't doing this no more. Like I got found out guilty. I done did the 10 years. My life done been spared a couple times. I right, like, I ain't, I don't want to keep shaking the dice. And then I got blessed because after I made that decision, I had my daughter. And once my daughter was them the, daughters do it, won't that, they? that was the, mmm, <laughs> this a little different now. Yeah. You know, so I was still, I was still investing in the stock market. I was using street money. But a part of me was like, I don't want my daughter, I don't want her to come to jail and visit me. Because I remember a partner of mine was 19, baby Al, he was out the Magnolia. He had 99 years, 18 years old. And, um, uh, I remember he had a, a daughter. And I remember one day we were sitting on the on the bed and his 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 little one came saw him. And when his little one left, now he on a whole murder charge. He started crying. He was like, dog, I ain't gonna never see my little one again. And he was like, man, these white folks done gave me 99 years. And he ain't never, you know, you don't take accountability for it, but you like them white, them white folks ain't give you 99 years, bro. You get yourself 99 years. And I told myself, like, I don't never want to be that. And so I ain't going to lie, I always give credit to my daughter because she the reason why I went cold turkey on the streets and she the reason why I felt like I'm going to do something different. And so because I saw so many of these, you know, just white people making so much money in the stock market, I was like, yo, I could do that shit. It should remind me of the streets anyway. And so that's how I just pivoted to it and I just, like, stuck with it. Um, and, and that was it. That was kind of it right there for me, for real. I want to go back to this white folks giving him 99 years. Yeah. I see it a little differently. All right. I think he put himself in the position for them white folks to give him 99 100%. years. They absolutely gave him 99 yeah. years. And that's the trip part about it because, you know, we, we, we put ourselves in these positions oftentimes and then we end up going into a courtroom and we basically throw ourselves on the mercy of the court and mm -hmm. hope that these people show us mercy, mercy who was hired to not show us mercy. Mm -hmm. You see, that's what we have to understand. It's not fair. It's not for us. Mm -hmm. In fact, the only thing that is for us is punishment. Yes. This is why they do what they do. So when they see us, it's like job security. Yep. Just understand that. Every time you go out there and make that little old lick, yep. Soon as you step off that porch and do this or whatever, mm -hmm. you grab that pistol and you put that thing in somebody's face mm -hmm. or whatever, that's job security to them. Mm -hmm. They really ain't tripping. All this stuff about 
these people being scared of. These people are not scared of it. They got all the guns. They got drones. They got tanks. And the they got bombs. <laughs> they got the laws. They got all yeah. of that. They're not afraid of mm -mm. us. Uh, they, w let me put it like this. They're not afraid of us that act that way. Mm -hmm. They're afraid of us that act this way. That's a fact. This is what they're afraid yeah, that's of. That's a threat for them. This is what they're afraid of. And speaking of that, do you get any type of uh, like angst or hate from uh, traditional investors? Oh yeah, cause it's so. Let me say something right quick too. The I I agree with you on like he we put ourselves in position um, to we put ourselves in position for them to give us the ninety nine years, right? Like we put ourselves in that, and I think one of the is because they also they put us in the environment that is conducive to yeah. that. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And because we don't understand the gravitational pull that it takes to get out of that environment is oftentimes too much. You know, which is why even in New Orleans, if it wouldn't have been for like Katrina, a lot of people would have never left New Orleans. Because what it takes to leave is a lot. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm. It, what, that, that's the gravitational pull to go against what you've been taught, your normal. So like even in that area, and, I, and I'm going I'm to answer that, but I, I remember being in prison. One of the things that really stood out to me when I was talking to the guy, and I always talk about this, he showed me this picture. Now this 1999, he was in Iceland. First of all, I had never heard of that before. I'm 16. <laughs> and he was sitting in a lake that had steam coming from it with mountains in the back. So I've come to find out that that's called a blue lagoon. But in my mind, this how this how entrapped I was by my environment. I didn't think it was humanly possible for you to be around mountains and be in a warm lake at the same time. Like, that blew my mind. Like, I'm like, bro, I'm, in, I'm from the hood. Like, that, how can that be possible that that exists? So him showing me that kind of, like, stretched my mind of some of the possibilities. But f moving forward, 100% traditional people on Wall Street are traditional investors. 100% they don't agree with what I'm saying. They don't like it. Because what happens is anytime you are awakening a people— you are also taking away the strength that the overseer has, mm -hmm. right? So not only we are we are slaved economically and like mentally we enslaved, right? And there's always this thing that I like. It's a picture if you look at it. Um, they take a horse, and the horse been chained up for so long, to when they take the I mean been encased for so long they put the leash then tied to a chair and the horse will stay there. And it's because the horse is so accustomed to being on that where he don't move. And that's kind of how we be. Like, we so uh, accustomed to working this long. We so accustomed to retiring at such a... We, we so accustomed to going in and out of jobs. But that gives them security. Like, I even say, like, with banks. Like, the bank is not the best place to have your money. But we know it ain't the best place to have your money. But we've been taught that's the safest place to have our money. And we don't know where else to put the money. Just like people going to jobs with the 401k. That ain't the best place to do nothing, have your money. But because we don't feel like we adequate to manage our own money, we don't feel like we adequate to be responsible for our own finances, we think, yo, the job is the best place for us. They going to look out for me. No, they ain't. So when you talk about me telling people, man, you can invest better than your 401k, they going to defend that. No, they, I match that. They match me. Well, go look at the 11 to 17 sets of fees they got in there. Mm -hmm. Right? Go ask the person who retired at 65 from the 401k and the money they thought they had is one third less. Go ask that person that. But now it's too late. They, what they gonna do now? And there's nothing against it, but now they work in part time jobs. So people from traditional banking are gonna always have something against the person who is telling the people other than what they're saying because they're taught to sell us a product. Mm -hmm. They're not taught to enlighten you. The more people that don't want that product, the more commission you can't get. And so if you have a whole group of people that's saying, nah, I'm good, I can invest on myself, you've now put a dent in an entire field, um, a financial field. Yeah. Have they started trying to move the goalpost on you yet? Nah. It's going to be hard for them to move the goalpost, and people always say that, is because their money so tied into it. Mm -hmm. And the only way, and I'm not saying what they can't do because they write the rules, but they would now take, they would have to take away the individual investor 
And the reason why they, they're not going to take it with the individual investor or the retail investor is because on Wall Street, they call you dumb money. Right? So for every one of me, there's 2,000 of me that's going to lose money. Yeah. And that's where the one of you make money. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So they understand it. So in their mind, like, I'll let one go to get 1,000. Right? Mm-hmm. But what happens is when that one starts to change the reality for the thousands, then you now you sitting in a situation where what do they do? And I don't want to pound this, but now you start using music entertainment to give the people your version of success and wealth and not the true version. And so when you start, when we start to champion and when we start to glorify the things that they don't deem as wealth, then they can stay as financial predators. Mm. As long as we financial prey, there's always, just think about this, when a bear goes to the, the lake to catch the fish, he don't try to catch all of them. He's going to get one at a time. But he can stay at that lake and eat forever. He ain't never got to, he can always go to that lake and know I can, there's always an uh, abundance of fish <laughs> that I can eat from. Yeah. So the ones that get away, I ain't really, you know what I'm saying? I ain't really, <laughs> I ain't really tripping. So, and that's kind of in reverse. I'm the one that's going to get away, but the bear can always go there and eat from that lake. And not only just one, but the, they can go eat a mother, a father, a daughter, a niece. They can eat a whole bloodline for generations before somebody come along and say, no, we're going to do something different. Yeah. I heard you say you do you use money for three reasons. Yeah. One, access to information. Three, assets. Yeah. Explain that. Um, so you think about it from this perspective. The way to get new information is to be around people who are already where you want to be at. So for me, I always want to be around people who, so I always say that orthodox information gives you ordinary results. So what they teach you in school, you already know what the outcome of that going to be at. Like, for every person you see graduate school and graduate college, you probably see one per- that one person that's super successful. Everybody else got a regular 9-to-5 job. Everybody else retiring at 65. That's the goal. They cool with that. They going to die like that. Then there's the one person you like, damn, like, this person only got a business degree, and they really did something. They built this great company or something like that. So for me, I want to get around people that think different. That's the people you see going to make it in America, the people who think outside the box. That's that's always going to have a cost to it. So that's the access part. But in that is always information. I want to learn from people who have more information than me because the book is the foundation. But what happens is the people who think outside the box, they're going to take the book for the foundation. And then they're going to say, you know what? Let me add my sauce to it. It's kind of like your grandmother give you a recipe. You're like, damn, it's good, but it don't taste like grandma because she got the experience. She, it's, it's a certain way she whip her wrist. It's a certain, she don't use no measuring cups. Everything is eyeball. So what happens is if I can get around that person, then I can replicate what they got going on and I can add my sauce to it. I can only get that for being next to that person. So that's the information, that's the access, and then I become the asset. So I always want my money working for me. The more money I got working for me, the further and further I separate myself from being broke. The further and further I separate myself from being in poverty. The closer and closer I get to making wealth goals. So the goal now is for me to make as much money work for me as I can. A dollar that's not moving is a dollar that's losing. And if we understand that, that's the information, that's the access, that's the access. How do you deal with people that don't don't get that when they want to invest or they say they invested in your program, but they come on to the platform and they try to troll. Because I'd be on your social media all yeah, the time. thank you, brother. And, you know, you be putting in a lot of work, and, and there's a whole lot of people that come on and say how how great you are and, and how the program works for them. But then, you know, invariably you'll see these posts, and I've seen them on other people's stuff, so this ain't mm-hmm. exclusive to you. I've seen them on other people's stuff that, that are very reputable people. But I, you see these posts where people jump in and say, negative things mm-hmm. like oh it's a scam oh you just trying to get people money oh you don't really care about the people mm-hmm. you know does that discourage you at all not at all cuz i know that you just operating from a traumatic experience okay um 
one of the things me and my team are working on is talking about financial trauma, right? And so when we look at it as when we go to school, let's think about the, the blueprint that they've given us to, to live this American dream. What about that dream is something that you truly desire? And most people, they don't desire that dream, but they still work for it, so they've bought into the scam. They've mm. bought into that scam. You feel me? Like, the average person don't want to go to school for all those years. The average person don't want to work no job for no 40 years. You don't want to retire, and you only, the average, I think, age is like 72. You retire 65. So you're saying you done went to school all these years. You done worked all these years only to have 7, 8, 10, 12 years to retire and still have less money, but you still do it. You've bought into that scam. You've bought into it. And you okay with it. So now when you see somebody come along that is going against that, it's easier for you to say that that person is a scam because if you say that person is a scam, you can justify where you at. But if you say, nah, yo, what they taught me was a scam and that person may be right, now what that says is, damn, I've lived the last 20, 30 years of my life wrong. That's a hard reality. But then you have some people who like, you know what? Yep, I was taught wrong, but guess what? I'm about to pivot. Those are the people who you're going to see buying into it. Those are the people who you're going to see like, yep, it worked. I'm in it. The people who you're going to always have people that's going to say what you're doing is a scam. And I can't, I'm not here to fight them people. Because here's what I do know, and this has happened 90-something percent of the time. They'll come back. And they'll be like, yo, you was right. So one of the things I do on my Instagram is when I'm live, if somebody say you a scam, I'll be like, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let's go live. And I bring them on a live with me. And I can promise you this, OG. Every time I've done that, the person has come on a live and retracted the statement. Because now we can have a conversation. Why am I a scam, bro? Man, nobody can't get it how you got it. Why not? Because nobody got the money you got. Why you don't? Let's build it. But you ain't building. Yes, I did. 2018, 2017, I was making $100 doing this. I was making $500 doing this. But that didn't get glamorized. So now when I'm coming up and say, yep, we made $40,000 a day, $50,000 a day, you think that's a scam because, one, you don't believe that it's humanly possible that somebody like you can make that much money in a day from a game that they've taught you was a dangerous game. It wasn't for you. Nail on the head. See, I was getting there, but you beat me to the punch. <laughs> sure, you you got to be cold to beat me to the punch. Check this out, man. <laughs> Check this but, out. I was going to say that the one of the biggest reasons is they don't believe that you deserve the money mm -hmm. that you have and mm -hmm. you deserve the success and the followers mm -hmm. because you're black mm -hmm. and because they have a low opinion of themselves. There you go. And that's who's really kicking up most of the dust oh, yeah. is people that look like you, the people that you're trying to help the most. Mm -hmm. They're the ones, they really feel, they really have a low opinion of themselves. Because mm -hmm. I be on a lot of different platforms, and I don't see that on Grant Cardone's mm -mm. page. I don't see that on Tony Robinson's mm -mm. page, you know. I, I don't see that on, uh, what's the guy that Dave talks Ramsey. really, really loud? Oh, Tony Robbins, uh... 40s, about 40s years, in the 40s, really loud dude, cuss a lot. You know what I'm talking Gary about. That, huh? Gary V. Gary V. That's yeah. him. <laughs> they don't do that with Gary. They just be that guy's brilliant. That guy's yeah. so good because he gets results. Yeah. And and really at the end of the day, that's all that really matters mm -hmm. is results. If I'm getting results, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. The problem is the individual that projects his negativity on you mm -hmm. because he just can't stand what he looks at in the mm -hmm. mirror and he feels like he haven't gotten to where he wants to be in mm -hmm. life. And he's jealous because one thing that I've learned is that successful people don't spend time dogging successful mm -hmm. people. Successful people we do move. not, yeah. they don't spend their time online dragging successful people. Mm -hmm. They don't do that. Mm -hmm. It's always the motherfucker who ain't got that. <laughs> yeah. So, for me, I look at it, and I, I've said that to myself before. I'll be like, damn, like, you know, Tony Robbins don't go through that. Grant don't go through that. But I also realized this is, you know, we've been conditioned. So I'll give you a prime example. 
um, a while back, maybe like a year ago, I did this webinar. I'm on a webinar. I'm giving, I'm giving game, 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 game. And I got one of my Jewish friends to come on. And all he was saying was, yo, Trap, the truth. Y'all need to follow Trap. He the real deal. He helping people make money. He ain't give them no how-tos. I had 7,000 people on the, in, on the webinar. They were saying, oh, he going crazy. He cooking. And I say, damn, it's crazy because it take for them to validate me to my people, for my people to buy into me. You know what I'm saying? He ain't give him no game. All he was saying was, Wall Street looks like us now. Trap the truth. You know, y'all should follow him. Y'all ain't never had no. And they was going crazy in the chat. That goes back to a place where we always felt like we was inadequate. And we do it right now. We see our people still look for white Americans to validate us. <laughs> this, they still this, look for it. And this is why some white people have that sense of superiority. Yeah. Because they, they really do treat black people like they're their kids or something. Yeah. Like they act like they didn't, our mamas and dads. Yeah. That's why they be trying to control black yeah. bodies. You know, they try to control yeah. black bodies, man, because they, and they'll, they'll speak like, because they know a lot of black people are conditioned to listen to the white it's man, to listen to the white woman. Like whatever they say, they know if they say it, I've seen many videos where, let's say, an activist might say something mm -hmm. and, you know, that activist would get all types of mixed mm -hmm. uh, mixed uh, comments or whatever. Mm -hmm. White dude, white chick, I don't care how, it don't matter how articulate or inarticulate they are. If they say it, mm -hmm. automatically, they just automatically, they just give it credibility. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and to me, you got to be an uncivilized mutt <laughs> to think that way, to have a brain that thinks that way. But go ahead, but go ahead. Not the mutt, OG. Not the civilized mutt, man. <laughs> so you can you can see that now, like when you go on Instagram at the minute, I can tell you a post that'll always go viral, and we see it. Anytime a white person says that white America is wrong for the way they treat black people, that post gonna always go viral. Because black people like when Dad, you're supposed to say that. Yo, I don't care. Like I don't in my mind, I'm gonna be real true. I don't need nobody validation but the and I but the people I'm around, because I want them, like my team, I want them to always tell me if I'm doing right or wrong. And I don't know if that's really validating, but it's telling them, yep, we're on the right track because they believe in the mission. More importantly for me is being able to go in every hood and say, look, you can be a basketball player, you can be a football player, but look, if, you, if you're if an investor, you can outlast all of them. Mm -hmm. And we look at all the people that really were successful, Mike, Brian, they were great basketball players, but they became exceptional businessmen. They became exceptional investors. Kobe, exceptional investors. So for me, the proof is in the pudding. America rewards the entrepreneur and the investor. But why we not getting taught investment, we not getting taught in entrepreneurship because if I teach you, it's one of the things that people always laugh when I say this, the lion ain't never taught the giraffe, the elephant, or the zebra how to get away. He ain't never taught him that. You know what I'm saying? I ain't going to never take my food away from me. So why would I teach you entrepreneurship? Why would I teach you how to be an investor? Why would I teach you how to get in the stock market? Why would I teach you about, why would I teach you the things that have kept my family wealthy for generations? I'm not going to teach you that. So for me, being able to come in and be like, yup, I represent everything that, every, I check off every box on the list to be the statistic. I should probably check off some of them three times. But the stats and the facts ain't always real. And so we have the opportunity right now, and I feel like we have more information than any other generation before us. Right? I feel like every other generation, they fought for what they fought for in that moment. Right? Like they fought for civil rights because that was a thing. Um, you fought for voting rights because you needed that. So now... You have an opportunity now to have your civil rights and your voting rights, but now you got to get some money so you can amplify what your voice is. Because as long as you protesting and they lobbying, they gonna always win. Yeah. How do you get a guy from the hood to understand that he can win with stocks over drugs without risking his life or freedom? Mm, that's good. That's me, right? I'm talking to myself right now. Um, I, 
for me, it's showing them that it's the same game. Watch this. So, first of all, when you're in the street, you're not scared to lose money. And you're willing to take a risk. So let me break it down. The reason why you're not scared to lose money in the street is because you already understand that there's a possibility that you can get a bad package. There's a possibility that you could get robbed. There's a possibility that somebody's going to steal your stash. There's a possibility that you're going to have to throw the stash because you're running from the police. There's possibilities that's lost money. You ain't getting that back. So in the stock market, you might lose some money, but that ain't going to make you stop investing because in the street, you ain't never stop hustling when you lost a pack. That's one thing. Two, risk and water. So when you're in the streets, you already understand that going to jail and going getting killed it's part of this equation. You, you can't even play the game without acknowledging that these are real truths and you got to accept them. The stock market, you don't got to go to jail. You don't got to get killed. We go back to square one. You just risking losing some money. All right, so now we done did that. We done, we done took out the risk. We done understood the risk. We done understood the consequences. The next thing is, yo, what makes a good company good? Man, we'll make a good stock good. We'll make a good hustler good. One, you got to have a good product. Two, you got to have great marketing. Three, you got to have great consumers. Same thing in the streets. All right, so if I got a good product and I got good marketing and I got good consumers, then my stock in the streets done went up amongst my clientele. They can see me and all of us on the block together, but they'll be like, man, where Trap at? Man, Trap ain't out here. Come speak with me. Man, I'm going to wait for Trap to come back. Man, you tripping, man. I got to work, man. I'm going to holler at you when Trap come back. You know why? Because Trap take care of me. Trap got a good product. I ain't got to worry about him selling it to me watered down. I ain't got to worry about it not being good this time. And Trap let me spend with him, and I ain't got no money. Well, all that did was increase my stock in the streets. Well, a company got the same thing. Apple has what? Great products and services. Apple has what? Man, great customer support. Apple has what? Great marketing. Apple also has found a way to make us become just like the, 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 the junk in the street. Once you get an iPhone, you're going to attach the iPhone to the iCloud. Now all your information is right there. Now you don't want to switch products. You want to stay there. So why are we not buying the Apple stock? You know what I'm saying? So now it's making it relatable to them. Also, one of the things I did, my homies in the hood, I was like, all right, check this out. So from New Orleans, you know, we used to like to wear Tim's in the winter. We like wearing Dicky outfits. Yo, there's a company called VFC Brand. That company makes Timberlands and Dickies. If you're going to buy it, at least own the stock, bro. At least we could be owners of the stuff we wear. You know what I'm saying? So it was being able to find the little subtle things without trying to talk over their head to make them just realize, damn, I am about to go buy these Fendi's, huh? Man, I should just own LVMH because... Man, free got them on. You know what I'm saying? So it's making them understand that if we don't, we in the streets, bro. But if we don't switch from being consumers, then all we're going to do is spend the street money and then we go to jail and when we dead, we ain't got nothing to show for it. At least if you're going to go to jail, at least have an asset so your family can get them. And I remember I told one of my homies, I said, look, this was after I beat my charge. I said, bro, when they kick my doing, they ain't go to none of my stock market accounts. They just went to my bank account and they froze my truck. I said, oh, they ain't even play me smart enough to even play this game. So I remember telling my homie, bro, look, at least if you catch a bid, they don't think you smart enough to have the stocks. At least you can come home from doing a bid and you'll have some money for you. You know what I'm saying? So it was my, one of my favorite movies, The Spook That Sat By The Door. Uh, and that's kind of like the same concept. So it's being able to make those things relatable. Like, you ain't got to be the next Warren Buffett, bro. I ain't, nah, let's, let's use what we have Let's show you how it works, and then we can just play the game. Do you invest in cryptocurrency? Yeah. So I, I only invest in the big two, though. Yeah. Only Bitcoin, only Ethereum. That ain't oh, my yeah, game. Yeah. Okay. But right. I know yeah. those two are the big dogs. Yeah. So I got, I got a couple hundred thousand over there. It ain't doing too good right now. Yeah. But I, I'm here for the long haul. Yeah, you good. You good on uh, Ethereum and, and Bitcoin. Yeah, that's the two I rock with. Yeah, those are the big dogs. Got you it. in that crypto? Oh, absolutely. I can tell you, because what you asked me. Yeah, absolutely. You in the crypto. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. asked me that with a little arrogance. Like, you, what yeah. you doing? You talking to stock talk. <laughs> what you got? Talk to me. Teach me something, OG. Well, I like crypto because, you know, um, it's just, 
you know, the possibilities, you know, like they say, the greater the risk, the greater the reward. All right. It's one of the few games that you can take a few hundred dollars yeah. and turn into a million. Okay. Now, of course, that's a long shot, right? Yeah. But I like the long shots. I okay. like to bet on long shots. Okay. <laughs> so I, I so I have money in in Ethereum and Bitcoin too. Okay. And so I that that those are the those are the high cap coins. Yeah. So I got money in those, and I got uh, money in the mid cap coins. Okay. But the low cap coins is is my bread and butter. That's, uh, that's the bread okay. and butter because uh, first after I do my homework, you know, on on the stock, you know, I do a lot of trading with my nephew Henry, so. After we investigate the coin, we say, okay, yeah, that's a good one. They got a good team because, like, you're talking about team. You know, mm-hmm. like, what type of marketing do they have, mm-hmm. you know? You know, what kind of team is is is, is involved, mm-hmm. you know? Like, what kind, of, uh, what kind of money, what kind of liquidity mm-hmm. are they working with? Mm-hmm. We're looking at all of these things. Okay. And then we make a move. Sometimes there's riskier coins that just come out the gate and you just ape in on mm-hmm. just to see what happened, throw a little something on. If it happened, you know, you might walk away with, you, know, you might put up, you know, $1,000 and walk away with $200,000 in less than 24 hours. Come on now. You know, but if it don't, you lost $1,000, nothing venture, nothing gain. So that's how I look at right, it. Right, right. I only invest what I'm willing to lose and I mm-hmm. tell everybody the same thing. Like, <coughs> any anytime I invest, I'm looking at, I look at the investments that I make like if I were to go to the club, like, I know that on any given day, uh, I'm not a big drinker, but sometimes I will drop a few thousands, you know, on, you know, at the bar. Come on, OG. And, or I might go out of town. I might go to, I just went to visit in New York. Okay. And I spent the grip over there just traveling, just mm-hmm. traveling and being comfortable while I was there. Okay. That's a trap I did not have to take. Right. But I took it. And so to me... That's throwaway money. That I look at that like throwaway money. It's okay. money. It's money that I would have spent that I would not ha- that that I would not have otherwise. Mm-hmm. Right? It's just money that you know. So I throw something at the club. You know, I throw something at the bar. It's something that I maybe I I gave somebody an exorbitant gift that I didn't have to give them. Okay. Right. I. I Look at that type of money, and I take that same money and I invest. Invest it, it yeah. I just put that money in investments, and if I lose, I lose, and if I win, I win. So, I'm curious to know from you, like when when people win, I'm sure you get all of the praise, mm-hmm. but when they lose, uh, how often do they try to come at you and say, "Man, I lost my money, man. What you gonna do about it?" So I think um, I've done a great job at cultivating a certain mindset around this game. Um, I never lead with how much money I made. I never lead with, like, a certain lifestyle. I always lead with freedom. That's one of the things. So you take the... I take the home run hitting out of it, the equation. Like, yo, we ain't hitting home runs. We hitting base hits. Right? So if you go to the the bat and you try to keep hitting home runs then you're going to strike out more than you hit, and that means you're going to lose more. So and if I go to the bat and I'm hitting base hits, I'm going to have a better batting average, and then that's going to build my confidence up. So, I mean, you always going to get some people that's going to say, you lost me money, but nobody who, those are people who never pay me to be in a group or to take the course. Those are people who just saw me say something, and they took it and ran with it. Mm. Right. Another thing is, I've always led with do the research, y'all. So they didn't have a strategy. They, they, they just nothing. heard you they talking just, about yeah, something, they heard they a buzzword, and they and ran, ran with it. out there. Boom. Yeah. So, but so those come because you always gonna have those people who, again, because you financially traumatized, you always looking to get rich quick. You always looking for man. Let me take that. So for me, I'm always teaching people. Let's take the calculated risk. Like I don't. I'm gonna be real. I don't believe in high risk, high reward. I think I could take a low risk and still get a high reward. I like how you said that. I think I could take a low That's risk. Interesting. Yeah, I could take low Tell risk, high more. reward. All right, so let's think about this. So let's say you said something. You said you 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 look for the small cap coins, right? You can put a thousand dollars in, and it can turn into a hundred thousand dollars. But if it don't, you lose a thousand dollars. You okay with that? I'm I'm not mad at that. 
But in my mind, I can take a low risk and still get that same reward, but I may not get it tomorrow in 24 hours, but I may can get it in six months. Yeah. See, and I and I play that game too with, yeah. with the crypto. So that's, yeah. that's why I said I, I do the low, the low, yeah. the low risk, the high, high risk. Reward, yeah. I do all of that. Of course, I, it know, should I, be a part. I of do you. low cap. I do the mid cap. I do the high. I yeah. do the high cap. But you're right. You know, like I I have some of those positions where you know I take a lower risk, mm -hmm. and over time it mm -hmm. would be a you know a high reward. Yeah. Like so, my team right yeah. there. So they like I, they with me a lot. So we be in the studio. We'll be sitting down, and especially, especially B. We'd be sitting on, and I'd be like, B, that thing went up. And we made 60000 a day. You know what I'm saying? But that's something, prime example. So we, matter of fact, today, this company called Celsius, it's the company that makes the, the drinks. Today, the company popped $23, right? It popped $23 today. Now, my holding in that, because I own 250 shares of it, that's $23 on 250 shares that just popped today. You know what I'm saying? But also, prime example. Where did, I'll, you, where did you get in at? I think we even had it now. I won't say at 130. It's now 190 something, 180 something today. We got in at one, I think we probably got, in, probably got in at 125. But I only had it, for, we probably only had it four months at best. Three months at best, we up like 40 something percent on it. Mm. Right? But that's in buy and hold. So if I'm playing an options game, that's what they really be seeing me killing in that. So I done, I think maybe three weeks ago, four, a month ago, we was in this Facebook stock. We was in Facebook, and I said I was in Aruba for my birthday. This was a month ago. When they dropped the Threads app, when they dropped that, I said, ooh, this this one of them ones. Because they did like 7 million viewer subscribers in an hour, and in a week they did like 30 million. Uh, 100 million, something like that. I said, oh, this, I know how the stock market, they're going to look at this as good news. This is going to drive the stock up. Why? Because Mark Zuckerberg, is they, their business is based around data, and data sells ads. I said, oh, so that's 100 million new subscribers he have in another app that he own. This is going to push the stock up. We got in there 288. We bought 30 contracts. Cost me 113000 but in a week, that hundred and thirteen thousand already made me sixty thousand. By the time two weeks ago, before when I sold it, that one stock had already made me about seventy thousand dollars from that play. So how long did you stay in the option? How long? Was um, option? So I stayed in that one about a month. But I wanted did, to be. Did in you it. go to the end of the contract? No, no, no. So I got out early. <clears throat> I got out early. So I wanted to be in it for a year. So I love leap options, which give me the opportunity to be in it for six months, eight months, one year, 15 months, 18 months. I got out of there early because I said, oh, sept August is the second worst month in the stock market. September is the first worst month in the stock market. Together, the average stock has a return of 0.2%. I The market had went down two days in a row. This play was up 130%. Before I sold it, it was down to 80%. I said, you know what? <clears throat> Since I know what's ahead right now, let me take this 80% profit, take this $60,000, $70,000, put it on the side, and I let the market do what it do. The stock now is at 304. So if I would have stayed in it, I would have gave the market all those gains back. So that's the only reason I ain't staying in it. So not only, is I'm, not only am I about understanding what I'm doing, I'm also understanding the environment I'm in. You know what I'm saying? Environment is everything. So what type of economic environment is the stock market in? And that also made me make great decisions. So I'm like, you know, right now for the next two months, I'm going to just chill on my option plays and I'm going to just let my other accounts just do what they do. Hmm. But we talking in a, we talking about in one month from one play, we made 60 grand, right? It ain't, it ain't what I, I would never leverage 113 to make 60. I want 113 to make me 226. But, because the because the story changed, I'm not never gonna be mad at a sixty thousand dollar profit. Right. Right. Let, let, let's say I'm listening to this podcast right mm -hmm. now. Um, hell, I'm Willie D. I'm, I'm <laughs> Willie D. Back in the '80s. Come on. I got a job for the Houston Chronicle. I'm selling door-to-door -door subscriptions. Okay. And I'm getting about 
three, four hundred dollars a week. Okay. Let's say my bills are covered, and you know, at the end of the week, maybe I got a hundred dollars to spare. Mm-hmm. How can I get in the game? So I think the first thing that that person should do is build the liquidity up. So I think what you should do is say, let me split the $100 and say, let me put 50 up to save or 25 to save and put 75 in the market. Because I'm a firm believer in investing more than you save. But the issue that a lot of people going to have is they're going to try to invest the whole 100. And because they try to invest the whole 100, when something happened in life, now they got to sell the investment hmm. because you on a financial edge. So what I would tell you to do is, yo, take that 100 and every time you get paid, break it down so you can build up some of your savings money and you can build your investment money up. And if something happened in life, you ain't got to sell your investment. You can sell the savings and build that back up. So what's a good what's a good number to start with? Like, uh, you can, I guess you could start with any number, mm-hmm. but, you know, in your mind, you know, if you, you know, what's in your mind would be like a number you said, man, that's too late. Wait till you get five hundred dollars. Wait till you get a thousand. Um, I think because everybody finance and this ain't me trying to devoid the question. I think everybody financial situation is different. And so, man, OG you might start with five thousand. Wait, let me OG you might start with five hundred thousand. Yeah. I can. <laughs> I can. <laughs> but somebody else, five hundred dollars is a stretch for them. Yeah. So my thing is always, it's not where you started, it's where you in at, but I want you to be in position. That's my, I've been saying this, pushing this lately. You ain't got to be right, I just need you to be in position. So if we make it a habit of saying, all right, if I want to get in this game and play it, I'm gonna, every time I get paid, I'm about to put money in my investing account. And watch this, I'm going to find one company that I really want to own. And one, let's say I want to own Apple. For Every week, I'm going to put money in this account, and at the end of the month, I'm going to buy me an Apple stock. I don't care what the price is because you beginning. I don't need you to focus on being Warren Buffett right now. I don't need you to focus yeah. on trying to be Wall Street Trapper right now. I need you to focus on getting consistent at playing the game. Yeah, and let me say this right quick, too. Uh, for those of you who might be a little intimidated by getting into the stock market, you can put that on automatic. Yep. You can basically just, there's a feature that, that are on these trade sites yep. that will allow uh, them to take money out your Every account imme- you know, automatically, yep. weekly. Yeah. Yep. So that would be my thing first is every week find a stock that you want, Apple, whatever. I Apple costs 140 something. Every week I'm going to put money here. Once at the end of the month, However much I got, I'm going to just buy the Apple stock. I don't care what the price is. Next month, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to just buy the Apple stock. Next month, I'm going to just keep doing that. Because what you're doing is you're getting accustomed to playing the game. You're getting accustomed to delegating your money. I'm playing a game, and every week, I'm putting $25 up to save. Every week, I'm playing a game, and I'm putting $25 up to save. At the end of the month, I'm going to buy the Apple stock, and now I got $100 saved. Guess what? Next month, I'm going to do it again. Well, what's going to happen is internally, you're going to start saying, you know what? I don't really need to be eating that. I don't really need to be spending that. So now instead of me saying 75, man, this week I'm putting 100 in there and I'm putting $50 in the savings. We move like that. Once we see progress, that's human nature. That ain't black. That ain't white. That's human nature. If I see progress in anything, I'm going to attack it. And I'm going to attack it vigorously. So building that habit of doing it Every week, as much as you can, start wherever you can. In order to build a house, you got to start with one brick. And so that's my goal. That would be my thing is start what you can, but let's make it an automatic withdrawal every week that we putting the money in the account. And then once a month, you buying the stock that you like. And now, let's go even further. You can say, once I buy 10 shares of Apple, now I'm going to go to my next company. So once I bought the 10 shares of Apple, now let me find another company I want to buy 10 shares in. Once I get 10 shares of this company, let me find another. Then once you get five companies, now you got 50 shares. Let's make the goal 100 now. All right, now I want 50 more shares of Apple, 50 more shares of this other company, 50 more shares. You feel what I'm saying, OG? I know what you're saying because I do the same yeah, thing. Yeah, we're taking it like, step by yeah. step. It's, we yeah. ain't even making this hard. Yeah. We making this. Now what happens is you become repetitious. Okay, I got my, mm-hmm. let me just 10 shares. I got a t- I got five set stocks. I done bought 10 shares in each one. My next goal, 20 shares. Boom, we now you're going to look back in a year or two, you're like, damn, I got 70 shares. Boy, I'm, I ain't even know I could do that. Yeah. 
Because now you're not focused on trying to get it right. I'm not trying to focus on getting at a discount like Wall Street Chopper. He's been doing this a little longer than me. Wall Street Chopper on his second book, his third book. I'm on the first book, chapter one. We in two different, you know what I'm saying? So I want you to start there and then move your way up. Yeah, yeah. How uh, How is moving your way up in fatherhood working out? Man, I pride myself on being an amazing father. To say I ain't, Matter of fact, when we came, I had to stop because my daughter called me. Yeah. Um. I I think I'm probably one of the best fathers I know. Um, and I set the tone for it. Everybody around me see me. My daughter could call. I'm stopping. What's up? Um. One of the things I did, I moved my daughter, Mama, from New Orleans to Atlanta. Put her in her own crib. Um. And I told her, I got you till you get yourself together. And I'm not saying she's not together, but reestablishing her brand, reestablishing her business, reestablishing, you know, being in a new state. Um, and I did that because even though we're not together, I understand that she makes my life easy. She's the reason I can travel because she's not, no, it's your turn to watch her. It's your turn to do this. Come get her right now. She understand what I'm doing. And so for me, it's easy for me to replicate that generosity and that appreciation. But also, I learned so much from my daughter. She made me vulnerable. She made me feel emotionally. And what I do with my daughter, I may be overcompensating. But because I've never met my father, everything that I wish my father would have done for me, I do for her. How old is she? My daughter is seven. Oh, boy. boy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to have to have some conversations with you. Come on. We here, man. <laughs> man, look here, man. You know what? I personally think, you know, I might catch a little flack about this, but I'm going to take, you all right, we catch I'm gonna take my chance. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm going to take you, my chance. You ain't never ran from nothing, man. <laughs> I think that if a man's going to have children, mm -hmm. he should have a daughter first. Mm, I ain't and, mad at that. And here's the reason why I say that. When you have a daughter... Yeah. It makes you want to live yep. more. That's a fact. If you have a son, you want to live, but it's like you know he can carry your legacy. That's a fact. But you, you know, and you know you can give him certain tools to navigate yep. this world. But when you have a daughter, you want to be here every waking no, day. That's a fact. You want to be there to, to, to cover her. Yeah. To make sure she's good. To yep. protect her. You know, you want to be there. I'm talking about the loving father. I ain't talking about you uncivilized much. I'm talking about the fathers. <laughs> I'm talking about the real fathers out there. Man, y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what's, what's he? Are you taking it too far? Not the mud, OG. <laughs> Not the mud, OG. Nah, but I'm with you on that because yeah. um, I always say that if I would have had a son, I wouldn't be Wall Street Trapper. Mm. Because I was so, you know, I was so attached to the streets and the way that I was, I would have probably did my son almost the same that my mama did with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. what you crying for? Come on, boy. What you doing, man? You know, I would have... My daughter made me emotionally responsible. She made me emotionally aware. She made me look at the world different. Like, wait, hold up. Even the way I look at women, deal with women. Wait, I got a daughter. Right. Hold up now. <laughs> Back up now. You know what I'm saying? Yes. So, yes. I, I agree with you on that. Like, I think having my... Even talking to my team... Like, they men, but I'm more communicative with them because I got to always explain and talk and be patient when I'm talking to her. That's right. So it doesn't help That's me. Right. Like, all right, man, what's wrong? All right, let's talk about it. Man, how can I help you? What's your perspective? What can I do? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Having my daughter taught me how to talk softer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, because, you know, you have to be cognizant when you're talking to a girl, a mm -hmm. woman. My, my daughter is 27, 20, 27, 28 now. Okay. So, although she's a lawyer, mm. she's still a woman. Man, let's hold up. Let's salute to that, man. Come on, man. You got a lawyer, man. Yeah. Come yeah. on, man. Let's salute yeah. to the OG, man. That, Come man. Come on, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, but but she she is still very much in tune with her femininity. Mm -hmm. And she's a woman. And so I can't, I, I got to remember, like, hey, you know, hey, man, I'm a ghetto boy, but right now, ah! <laughs> you, know, I got, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I got to make sure, I got to be reminded that I'm talking to a woman. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes you better and it makes you want to live. Mm -hmm. You know, 
I'm talking about again. I'm not, I ain't talking to you uncivilized much. I don't know nothing what I'm talking about. Now, was you there when, when your daughter was born? Yes, indeed. Say, dog. Talk I about, flew in. So, talk about that experience. I, um, so me and her mama, we wasn't seeing eye to eye at the time. I had moved to Atlanta. Um, I just saw another opportunity for me, and I didn't handle this situation right. And um, but I under, I knew when that that date was. So I flew in town, and I was excited, man. Until they put the robe on me, I went from excitement to scared. <laughs> I was petrified. I put the robe on. I'm shaking the doctor like, yeah, this your first one? I'm like, yeah. He like, I could tell. Now, what are you petrified about? Man, I had no idea, man, because I, I was, I don't know. I was like, I just, I, this a life. You know what I'm saying? That I'm responsible. Now, this is the thing, too, OG. I ain't never been responsible for nobody for myself. I ain't never been responsible for nobody but myself my whole life. When I was homeless at 14, 13, 14, when I was in prison at 16, I was only responsible for myself. I wasn't never mad at my family. I ain't never say my family did me wrong. My mom and my grandmother taught me survival skills. I'm responsible for me. All them thoughts are just going through my head like, man, I got to make sure this baby eat. Man, I got to make sure I protect her. Man, I'm a, man, it's Dr. Bed not. So when I get in there, so my daughter, mama had a C-section. So the doctor actually let me pull my daughter out. So the doctor went in there and like got her. And so I'm standing like, I don't want to touch her. I'm just standing looking. And she was like, daddy, come over here. So I went over there and she was like, put your hand in. So I literally put my hand inside of my daughter, mama and pulled my daughter out. And I was like, take a doctor, I'm about to drop her. <laughs> I was petrified, so I took her. They let me cut the thing off her, and I'm like, "Why is she so bruised up and all that? Like, what's going on in there?" So, but the the one thing I will say is, the minute I put it in my hand, it was the minute immediately I said, "I'm not going back to the streets." Got to be on the ground for him, man. Because you I can't, said, I ain't you going can't back. raise babies from the pen. I said, "I ain't going back." That's yeah. a wrap. I ain't going back. That was that was the I'm. Like, once I looked at her, she was crying. I said, man, I, I ain't going back to no streets, man. You, you know, it's a very vulnerable position to be in. Locked up. Oh, yeah. And another man. Taking care of you. Taking care of your oh, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, 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 that really make you feel like you're on some sucker shit. And, and you should. Yeah. You should, man. Like, so, I've made... And let me credit my daughter, mama, because I didn't just make them. We both made them sacrifices. My daughter made us get along. And we didn't have a bad relationship, but I just handled some. Like, when I came to Atlanta, she didn't want me to leave. But I felt like I was doing the right thing, and I didn't know how to communicate. And my thing was, man, you tripping, man. I'm about to, you know. And I had to... Go to her and tell her, man, I handled that situation wrong. Like, let's let's talk about it. And I remember telling her, I can only be a great father if you allow me to be a great father. Because if you decide to try to keep my daughter from me or something, now we wasting time fighting for her than loving on her. And so we just had a great conversation for like two hours. And between, my daughter was born in 2016. Between 2016 and now my daughter's seven, we probably had like three disagreements. Because we always communicating. And so I know the sacrifices that I've made as a father. I know some of the arguments that I've not indulged in because I'm asking myself, do, and this is why I credit my OG, my other OG, Eric Thomas. He told me something one day in his mentor, she be said, do you, does you being right move the needle in this relationship? And so what happens is a lot of times we want to prove that we right, but it don't do nothing. It don't do nothing. You just want, I got to tell them how I feel. <laughs> but what does that yeah. do? It, does, it don't do nothing but add more conflict to the, so I've had situations with my daughter, mama, say something and I'll be like, for sure. She not disrespectful. She just telling me her perspective on it. And I had to ask myself, like, is this a battle that's worth me fighting right now? Because it don't do nothing. It may be like, did prime example, she called me, I, she wasn't home, I was on a flight, my daughter mama went to the store, Kroger, 
to get something to eat for them. But my daughter just called me and said, Daddy, I'm hungry. So I'm like, where your mom at? Well, she texted me, she said, Daddy, I'm hungry. I'm like, where your mom at? She like, she went to the store. I'm like, all right, you want me to order you some wings right quick? She was like, yeah. So I ordered the wings while I'm on the airplane. So her mama texted me about 20 minutes later and was like, did you order her something to eat? I was like, yeah. She was like, Leah can wait. I only been gone 10 minutes. She can wait to get till I get back. In my mind, I won't say, man, it's just some goddamn wings. Right. But um, is this worth me? So I was like, you know what, man? That's my bad. I ain't get all the details on it. She just told me she was hungry. I sent it. You know what? Next time, I'll communicate a little better to see what the deal is. That may not be something big, but that could have turned into something crazy via text. You don't know what people's emotions is. People take words wrong. You know what I'm saying? So um, having my daughter, the sacrifices I've made to be in her life, I'm going to be real with you. And I know people going to be, people probably say something to me, but I come from it. If you saying you in the street because you providing for your family, are you selfish? Because when you go to prison, we already talked about understanding that prison comes with it and death comes with it. Well, if you put yourself in a situation that increases your chances of getting killed, increases your chances to go to prison, who the hell take care of your kids while you're in prison? Who the hell going to take care of your kids while you're dead? Nobody. So the same yeah. people you say you protecting them from, now you just handed it to them on a silver platter. I think some dudes, when they say that, because I've said that myself before, not really understanding mm -hmm. the full ramifications mm -hmm. of my actions. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so it's like, but once you understand the depth yep. of those actions yep. and what could happen, yep. then you know, I can't do this. You can't do it. I can't put myself in that position because... If I play myself out of position, then the house is wide open to be raped and pillaged, you know. And this is why single parent households, specifically single mother households, yep. uh, are so difficult to you know to to to, to live in, uh, you know, conducively. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? As far as like having, um, you know, a healthy home environment. Mm -hmm. People see that. People on the outside see that, oh, ain't no man in that house. Oh, for sure. But when they know it's a man in that house, oh, it's a man in that it's house. It's different. Let me, go in the, uh, in the, it's let me, different. Let me go in the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely hear what you're saying, man, because, man, you go out there and you get yourself caught up. Now, okay, you say you did it for the baby. First of all, they're not going to understand that. You can, nope. you can talk to you blue in the face. Yep. All they're going to know is You're that not here. you ain't there and you wasn't there. So get out of my face with yeah, that shit. You that's don't a run fact. Yeah, you don't run nothing over that's here. That's a fact, man. And that's the way it's going to go. Man, you know, I know you already know this, but I'm going to say it to the world. Come on with it. You're a good dude. Man, thank you, brother. And here's why I say that. Growing up, I used to watch men, mm -hmm. the type of men that I wanted to be. Mm -hmm. And I said to myself, I said, all of the all of the men that I know who are good fathers are good men. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I could be a good father, I would be, be a good, good man. man. Yep. I know some dudes who are who are good, who don't have children, mm -hmm. you know, but they're good men. Mm -hmm. You know. But the the dudes out there that I that have uh that the dudes that I know that are bad guys, mm -hmm. bad a lot of them are bad fathers too. Mm -hmm. But I don't know any good fathers who are bad men. Mm -hmm. Because it's a it's a it's a sense of integrity in you. Um it's a it's like a a wiring that's inside of me. Um I think I was on a radio station the other day out here and um one the 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 host asked me um about being a father and I said um about my father. <clears throat> and I said, I don't... She said, asked me, did I regret not seeing him? And I said, I don't know if I regret it, but I just know there are some things in my life that I know that ain't come from my mama. Like, there are certain mindsets and there are certain attributes about me. I know my mom. I've been knowing my mama my whole life. I know this ain't come from her. Now, where it come from, and I'll be like, I wonder if that come from my dad. When I look at my daughter, I see me. I said, oh, yep, that's me. I ain't much mad at that. Let me help her with that right quick because this is how that's going to turn out. And so I can see how much, I can see the profound impact that I have on her life. 
I can see, you know, she watching the show. Dad, I'm, I'm subscribed to Trap and Tuesdays. I'll catch her sometimes telling me some of the stuff I said on TV. I'm like, where you heard that at? Oh, I heard, I saw your ad, Daddy. Uh, I saw this. And so that makes me proud. And so it goes back to, you know, as men, man, being a husband, I've never been one. But being a father, that ain't no, there's a lot that comes with that. And you got to be willing to stand in that. And it ain't always going to be easy. And so I go back to looking at seeing my homies in jail when we in prison, knowing what your family got to go through to come see you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I ain't want my daughter to come see me in prison because then you start to normalize her coming see you in prison. Now you normalize the prison experience. Oh, I know what it's like to go see my daddy in prison. So what happened when she date a dude and he go to prison or something? Oh, I know how to... No, I don't even want her to be in a situation like that. I don't want her to think that that's okay. I don't want you to be a ride or die. I don't want you to be that. I want you to be like, no, I'm getting some money. My daddy taught me how to do business. My daddy taught me how to get money. My daddy taught me how to be an entrepreneur. My daddy... I, I travel with my daughter all the time. I take pride in that. Before we started the tour, we just did eight cities. I said, we about to take this week off. I'm going to take my daughter to Disneyland, y'all. Took her to Disneyland, came back. We get busy. After the tour, I'm like, hey, after the tour, where you want to go at? You want to go to Bahamas? I bet we're going to go to Bahamas. I take pride in spending time with my daughter, and you can't be around me because I take pride in being a, 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 a dad. You really can't be around me if you ain't a good dad. So my dog, Jose, on side of me. Man, this man would drive to Maryland and go be with his kids for nine. I'd be like, bro, where you at? Man, I'm, I'm driving to Maryland. Bro, why you don't catch a plane? Man, I need some time to think. Yeah. He, every, he go and drive to go be by his kids. That's important to me. Yeah. That tells me about integrity, and that tells me about how you wired as a man. Yeah, I rock the same way, man. I don't rock with dudes who are not good fathers. Yeah. Because if you you ain't good to the person you brought into you the world. You damn sure will be good to me. I know what you'll do to me, <laughs> you know. So I don't rock with the, all of my partners. Facts. Go hard for that. Salute to that, man. All of my partners. Salute go hard, to that, man. And salute to the tour, man. Man, you've been yeah. doing numbers, man. And, Thank you, brother. And, and you got a hell of a presentation. I got a chance to check out the tour. Thank you, man. You know, it, it was it was cool. A lot of good information. Thank you. Uh, the, the people, the audience was locked in the yeah. entire time yeah and it looked like everybody received the information yeah. as far as what i could see yeah now what's coming up next like not exactly right next but i'm yeah. just saying like what is the i know you're you're on tour and i know you're going to keep this thing going for a minute but what has been the favorite part your favorite part of touring um honestly watching my team interact um because this is new for us so so i'll give you an example so I got my cousin with me. I got a, a childhood friend of mine with me. They ain't never stayed in the, the type of hotels that we staying in. This tour costing me a bag. But I'm willing to do it because two things. I want my audience to know I'm coming to them. And I want my team to understand what we building. So when I see my, my cousin and I see my childhood friend staying in the hotel that we staying in, I know we, like, they be geeked up, right? I enjoy that. It's a new experience. Um, my guy B right here, like, he had a little hardship before. And I was like, B, man, I, I want you on the team. And so now as he grow and I, I can say that being with this business allowed him to find, because he told me, he said, Trap, man, thank you, bro, because this is my purpose. Like, I don't got to be the man on the front. But if I'm helping a man, and I look at it, and Jose the same way. Like, everybody know about, and I'm going to just use this, everybody know about David, but nobody understands that Jonathan played a key component in that. And Jonathan was Saul's son. Jonathan the one that told David, hey, my daddy trying to kill you, bro. I ain't going to go against my daddy, but my daddy trying to kill you, and you need to, get, you need to be on your P's and Q's. So sometimes it's okay to be the man that's helping the mission move, and you thrive in that because I don't know how to take pictures. I don't know how to record. But if you look on Instagram, that content coming out smoking. That's because of my team. And the more we get to do every city together, we get to build the continuity and we get to all have the vision on how big we want to go. 
And if we can all vibe together, then the audience get the amazing experience. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And so one of the things for me is I know the people come to see trap, but when they start, when I start talking about Jose, they dying laughing because they they done built a rapport with him over the week. Mm-hmm. When I start talking about my dog Tootie, or when I start talking about George, the crowd going wild because I've highlighted them for so much. They've built that, and that's probably the thing that I admire the most, seeing that my audience is getting their time and then Ned, my team, is buying into it too. Yeah, yeah, everybody's buying into it. Yeah, everybody's man. everybody's buying into Wall Street Trapper, Let's man. Go, man. You know, you took care of your business, man. Now, how can people reach out and get at you, man, if they want to be part of what you're doing? Uh, first, you know, Instagram, wall underscore street underscore trap. I think we right at like 1.3 million subscribers. The reason why I'm saying that is because you got a whole bunch of fake pages. So make sure you check that out. But then more than anything, um, check out the podcast. You know what I'm saying? Um, Trapping Tuesdays. Um, we do that every Tuesday on YouTube on the Wall Street Look Like Us Now Network at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, and then just we put out a dope episode every Thursday. So check us out right there. And just thank you for this opportunity, OG. Absolutely, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Leon Howard, <laughs> a.k.a. Wall Street Trapper. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> no more talk. Yeah. <laughs>